managed to find it here, which is fantastic. Now, this morning, our second of our core conference speakers in this room is Robert Collins here. So would you all please make him feel welcome? Thank you. So I'm going to talk about re-implementing a Google white paper in a completely different language on a VM because I make good decisions in my life. Um, I'm happy to take questions at any time. This light's quite bright, so you might need to gesticulate a lot. Um, I don't want to wait for a mic to be carried around, but I'd like to resolve any confusion you know, as it goes, and we'll hopefully have some time for more questions or, or a batch at the end where we can do the whole mic runner stuff. Um, so this story starts back in about 2008 when Google started building an internal load balancer that they call Maglev. And in 2016, they released a white paper on it, which got some attention, it got some people thinking about it. And um, one of the obvious big questions is, you know, why? We've got LVS, we've got Squid, Varnish, HAProxy. Do we actually need a new thing? And of course, some people picked it up, became a news item. I saw it and I started having these questions and thinking about it. Some of the news articles went a bit off the rails. You'll note up there it says, Google open sources its load balancing train maglev. <laughs> I am not aware of Google load balancing, uh, open sourcing this. It's available as a service, but getting access to the source, I'd love to get access to the source. As it happened, I had about a month of time. I was transitioning from one employer to another, and there's this furlough period where you're not allowed to work for the new employer, VMware, you're not allowed to work for the old employer, HP, so clearly I should mow the lawns. Uh, there's some toys that I could fix. There's some badly designed appliances. I could do some 3D printing to, to fix that up. Or I could make a really good decision. So I want to talk about kind of the big takeaways from this for me at the beginning so you can bear them in mind through the talk. And if we run out of time, you'll at least have the punchline. So Rust is fantastic for systems programming. Um, there's a lot that can be said about Rust. I don't want to spend this talk doing that. Uh, the key things for me, though, you need to allow time to ramp up. It's not just learning the syntax, which might be different or it might be similar to what you know. You need to learn how to work with a borrow checker, and I mean work with, because you won't work against it. You need to figure out how to do unit tests. If you're coming like me from a very dynamic language background like Python or, or Rust, you'll be used to mocking stuff out to, to give yourself just in time a layer where you can isolate your tests. But in Rust, which is trying to do sort of static analysis of everything and join it all together, um, at link time, everything that's going to be called is known. You have to explicitly add those layers. You have to pay a runtime trade-off where you have it, so you don't want to do it at every point in your application. Um, you need to allow time to get to grips with Cargo. Cargo is great. It will allow you to have multiple versions of a dependency compiled into your binary at the same time. This is unexpected. It's useful. There's good reasons for it. I'm not criticizing it. And it does this except when it doesn't. So system packages can't do this. And where it gets really awkward and this is an emergent behavior, I don't think there is a better option, is when you have a system package like something talking to the kernel and user bindings on top of it that want different versions of it. And, and that's just not resolvable. Um, if I'm wrong, please. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and finally, there's a lot of stuff in the standard library. But there's even more stuff out in the cargo community space. And I couldn't have done what I did without leaning on that. So if you are looking at picking up Rust for something, do not limit yourself to the standard library. That will make your life much harder than it needs to be. I am deeply in love with PNET. Even next time I have to do anything with packet manipulation, I am going to be going and doing it in Rust with PNET if I have any say in the matter. Um, I'll get into some of the caveats about that later, but zero cost abstractions on bit level manipulation and the definitions that are not even byte aligned, yes. This is PNET. This is what you can do with it. Um, networking has a much deeper dependency stack than you think about. Now, I knew going into this all the bits of the stack. I've been around doing networking stuff for a very long time. 
at least as far as my lifetime is concerned, a long enough time. But I didn't actually think about all the bits at the start of the project, so I had some surprises along the way. You can avoid yourself those surprises if you sit down and you know, very carefully figure out how it's all going to hang together. Um, and there are often better ways of doing things. So you might sit down and you might spend three or four days looking up tools to do a particular thing and then you find out three months later that there is a fundamentally different and much better way of doing it. That didn't happen to me, not at all. One really interesting thing is that CPUs can do an incredibly large amount of work but you have to work very carefully within the places that they pay overheads. Stalling for data, all of that work suddenly disappears. Uh, the design of maglev, and to the extent I've implemented that in my project, Rusty Rail, is designed to, to leverage that raw computation to the greatest amount possible. Um, I've had some discussions with friends of mine who know more about the stack and were able to shed some light on it. Uh, and there's decisions there that could be done differently, and you'd have to actually spend a whole bunch of time profiling and testing to see which route is going to work better. But the, the underlying machinery you're working with is well understood. Although Spectre and Meltdown kind of, you know, maybe we don't understand it as well as we thought. And ultimately, I think my experience with this is that it would be valuable to the open source community, particularly to folk who are doing operations and, and sites, to teach LVS the innovative bits of Maglev, because Maglev has some really good stuff in it. So let's talk about that a little bit. Um, who here is not familiar with LVS? It's just at a cursory kind of level. All right, so there's enough people, I will, I'll add a little bit of text here. So LVS is the Linux virtual server um, system. It comprises some user space bits and some kernel bits. So it can do packet handling in the kernel, but you are paying most of the kernel network stack to do that. Um, the packet flow in LVS is very configurable. There's lots of modes you can run it in. The one I'm going to describe up here is the direct server return tunnel configuration, which is the closest to the maglev configuration. And I realize I haven't told you anything about maglev. We've only got an hour, so I'm being very picky about the bits I tell you about. In LVS, packets come in all the way through to the LVS director in regular form, and the director in this mode wraps them up in an IP and IP packet and then sends it on to the back end. The back end then replies directly out through your network stack. In maglev, the router wraps it up in GRE, which could be IP and IP, they're, they're functionally equivalent. Um, and this has a couple of big significant changes. One is that maglev doesn't need to change the size of the packet. So a packet that comes into LVS, LVS has to add an IP and IP header at the front of it. That means it can't do zero copy IO as easily, if at all. Whereas maglev can just change some bits in the packet and send it on its way. Of course, this isn't safe. <laughs> And so that was one of the interesting things that turned up. Um, the maglevs don't even have to be on the same network segment. So with the regular router config talking to it, once you do the IP and IP, you can have your backends anywhere that you want, but your LVS directors have to be directly on the segment where that route takes the IP, the virtual IP that you're serving. So if you want to scale beyond a single switch, then that can get tricky. Uh, yes, you can buy a bigger switch, but if you want to keep things commodity and just horizontally scalable, being able to move things around is valuable. So this, these are kind of two key differences. Um, unfortunately, this also is reflected in terms of the requirements. So LVS in this configuration needs mirroring support in your network switch. You have to send the same traffic to every LVS server. Um, because the LVS server is performing the encapsulation, you don't need anything special in the router on that side. Maglev kind of flips this around, as I was just describing. The router has to do the encapsulation. So most routers will be able to talk GRE tunnels, so GRE seems like a pretty good choice. It's not clear to me whether um, it's the best choice, and um, I haven't got the time to go and sort of do a, an audit of all the different router models out there and their capabilities, so I just like, okay, Maglev does Jerry, I'll do Jerry. It's good. Um, one of the things is that the router needs to be pretty consistent about where it sends the data. In kind of a steady state context, it will work if it sent the data to any of the maglevs. I'll talk about how that works later. 
but if you've got lots of churn going on in the maglev of infrastructure itself or in the back ends, there are corner cases where this can result in, in broken connections. Um, I think this is something that should be made pluggable. At a minimum, we should be able to GRE, IP and IP, VXLAN, like different sorts of encapsulation at this layer. But possibly being able to do radically different configurations so that you can work in AWS, like you can run a container or a set of containers in AWS and just use the same API to do your balancing, that might be useful. Um, I don't have a kind of clear, it should be this way or, or better in this regard proposal to make. Just It seems like this is a good place to make it pluggable. Um, the back-end selection. So in LVS, you've got these kernel tables and you've got a selection algorithm and you've got an external process that updates those to provide health status about the back-ends. This, because it's poking straight into the kernel, typically runs on the same machine. It's tricky to move it externally. You could write an API around it, but it hasn't been done. Um, and the, um, the way it is destination is chosen is also pluggable. So you can do round robin, you can do weighted round robin, you can do source hashing, destination hashing, lots and lots of ways. And the, the backends that are in there are presumed to be healthy. And this applies to both LVS and Maglev. You can't tell if the backend's not healthy. If you send a packet on an IP network, you might get a reply back saying, by the way, that packet couldn't be delivered. You might not, it's not guaranteed. If the back end's there, but not actually doing the three-way handshake properly, you won't be able to tell because that return path traffic doesn't go through LVS, it doesn't go through Maglev. So you have to design your algorithm on the basis that the back ends are presumed healthy and you just hope. Maglev is not, um, it's not pluggable, it doesn't do any kind of weighting or um, ratios between the servers, it just takes a hash. So it takes a ha uh, what's called a five tuple hash, which is the source IP, the source port, the destination IP, the destination port, and the protocol. And this obviously only works for UDP and TCP and, and port-based protocols, something like GRE being fed through this. In principle, it could work, but you'd need a different uh, lookup algorithm. Um, one of the things that's called out in the Maglev paper is that they built a very, very consistent hash. So you end up being able to deliver um, like within 1% variance across your servers if you want to. Whereas other protocols would be like plus or minus 10 or 15%. And when you look at the number of servers you need, you have to provision the largest of that variance across all of them because you don't know where it's going to land. So this can be kind, quite expensive when you're talking about a large number of servers. Um, again, the back end is presumed to be healthy. So this connection cache here is not kernel contracting. Because again, the kernel is not going to see a full connection come up. It's just going to see the SYN packet. And in fact, because we're doing user space networking, it's not even going to see the, the SYN packet in the kernel layer. So the connection track is used to deal with the situation where the number of back ends has been reconfigured. Someone's added a back end. Where you hash things to is going to change. All the existing connections well, one nth of the existing connections would be broken as a result of that. So the connection cache allows the existing connections to not go through the lookup, not be affected at all, as long as the traffic is still arriving on a maglev that had seen that connection at some point. And that's why you need the router to be reasonably consistent about what it does. Like, if maglevs are coming and going, it can change. But as long as you don't have maglevs coming and going and backends coming and going at the same time, then you're going to get very good results. So one of the interesting system things here is this is not aiming for perfection. It's aiming for very, very low overhead as you scale. Uh, and again, it's got an exterior process that is updating the health information about nodes. I believe at Google they put it in Chubby, but they didn't actually go into detail about that in, in the paper. Um, the big point here is that this is a user space API. It's a program you can talk to rather than the kernel. So you can do this remotely. You can do it through a network pro uh, protocol. So you don't need to kind of get your hands into the machine and talk to privileged parts of the machine to do this. And I think that's pretty important when you start thinking about the operational model of, of tools like this. Um, and I don't plan to make this pluggable. So if, for example, you might say, well, I, I, I've got to have it pluggable. I've got a machine that's twice the size of my other machines, and I need to give it twice as much traffic. And I would say run two servers and containers each size to half the machine, and then everything will be homogeneous. It will be identical, and you can get on with your life. 
Um, so active active properties, this is kind of the, one of the big bits that got me interested in, in, in playing with Maglev in the first place. Of course, I couldn't play with it because it wasn't open sourced. Um, you can run an arbitrary number of nodes um, in Maglev and in LVS, but in LVS, every node receives every bit of traffic because they have this thing called SARU, which is a peer-to-peer -peer negotiation about which parts of the IP address space each machine should handle. And rather than pushing that information back to the router, they say, give me all the traffic for the virtual IP and I will discard the bits I don't care about. And there's also traffic going between these LVS nodes to synchronize the connection tracking, which is needed for forwarding fragments properly um, and for dealing with a director failing. So the result of all of these things is the peak performance you can get out of LVS serving one VIP, no matter how big your cluster, is line rate for a single interface in your network. So if you've got 10 gig NICs and 20 gig of traffic, you can't do that on LVS today uh, or in that configuration. Maybe some of the other configurations might be able to do more, uh, but certainly the active active one can't. L uh, Maglev, every number of nodes, but each node receives one nth of the traffic. Your router is partitioning the traffic amongst your nodes, if you've got 20 gig of traffic and 10 gig interface cards and you know, two machines, they'll each get 10 gig. As long as they can forward that whole 10 gig, you're golden. Um, if, and and that, that applies linearly. There's no crosstalk between the machines. There's no synchronization. They don't need to talk to each other. They don't need to know the health of each other. So there is no barrier to linear scaling. So this, this is one of the really cool bits. And this applies whether you've got external traffic coming in or you're dealing with classic traffic within your clusters that you want to load balance. So it doesn't really matter where you're sourcing it, as long as it can go through a router that's able to do the ECMP spraying, uh, not spraying, the ECMP partitioning, you're able to scale up um, to, to ridiculous amounts. Um, fragment handling, so LVS just depends on the contract and everything landing on every node and that one node saying, oh, this is the IP I care about, so I'm gonna process it. Maglev does another hash algorithm on the three tuple, because in a fragment you don't know the ports, you only have the source IP, the destination IP, and the protocol. Um, so when they see a fragment, the first part of the fragment and the latter parts all get redirected inside the Maglev cluster to one other machine, which is picked by hash, and then that is responsible for reassembling. And it doesn't buffer them all, it buffers just long enough till it sees the first bit and then flushes them all independently. Um, there, it sounds like the Google network is heavily optimized to not have fragments, and I would expect any deployment of this to have exactly the same optimization, which makes sense anyway. Fragments, bad. Um, so, oh, so because that's a hash, that also gets spread over the whole cluster. So if you've got 50 maglevs, you don't have one that's groaning under all of your fragment processing. If it's, it's fairly distributed. Right. So here's one of the cool things. Remember how I said that Maglev is receiving the traffic already encapsulated in GRE. GRE can be sent out over the internet or over an interior WAN. So when you have all of your back-end services dead for a particular VIP, you can take them and instead of routing to the back-end in GRE the way Maglev normally would, you can send this to the GRE front-end of another Maglev node somewhere else. Just like a router sends traffic to that Maglev node in the first place, you can act like just another router, change the destination address, send it on, and trombone that traffic into that point of presence, back out, and over to somewhere else in the world where that service is still running, with no interruption at all. I mean, obviously, you were interrupted as your backend slowly failed, and it might not be a good idea to send, say you've got two sites, to double the traffic to the other site because one of your sites has died. That might compound the problem, but you have the choice. Whereas with LVS, you don't, because the virtual IP is being routed to that specific node, to the director, or the, the set of directors. If they try and send that traffic somewhere else, it's, not, it's just gonna come back to them. If they try and send it encapsulated somewhere else, they need to know the exact configuration of the backends. So rather than be able to say, okay, I've got a thousand backends here, and a maglev that knows about them, and a thousand backends over here, and a maglev that knows about them, now you need to have a 2,000 backends configured in this cluster and 2,000 configured in this cluster, and that is much more synchronization and updates and you, you know, which ones are local and which ones aren't, and it's just, it's a mess. So this is really, really nice and very kind of falls out cleverly from the, the design. 
Um, so I've talked about most of these. We've got the linear addition of nodes. You can scale to arbitrary bandwidth. Um, yeah, and so no global propagation states. The other, like I said, you don't need to know about all the individual backends, but you don't even need to know that all the backends in cluster A are dead to be sending traffic to cluster B. So if you've got a network partition happening in your control layer there, which is probably like the sort of thing will be going on at the same time, you're not blocked by that. You, it can just work. Right. Okay, so what could be better? And then I can start getting on to, to the, the things I did. Um, it would be really nice if you didn't have this heavy dependence on router capabilities. Running in AWS or Rackspace or some other cloud is much harder when you're expecting a fully functioned router rather than an SDN layer router. And it would be really nice also to not have as much privilege required in the machine. Being able to just take over the entire NIC and do all of the handling for it is not something most of are going to be super happy with. Um, so there is some other stuff that's been coming out recently. And this is stuff that's been maturing over the last few years. And I didn't find it when I started this project. Um, I possibly would still have done things exactly the way I did because I like Rust. Uh, but it could have been quite different. So traffic classifier and the express data path and P4, which is a, um, a packet manipulation language, really low level, looks a bit like C, but it's not. Uh, and eBPF kind of combine to let you write modules that will run in the kernel to process packets before they hit the bulk of the kernel stack. So you can get most of the benefits that Maglev is trying to achieve by using user space networking and working off the rings in the network cards. But you can actually go further and run this on the NIC itself. So the NIC, in its offload mode, can run some fairly arbitrary code. And the more modern the NIC you get, the more complex that code can be. So in principle, you could do this. You could have a user space control layer. You could have an eBPF layer that you're updating that's got your metadata about where backends are and the VIPs that you're using. And you could send some signals back to user space to get updates for that and to provide statistics. And you could track your, the connection tracking that you need to do internally in a kernel map. And that might work really, really well, with some of it offloaded all the way down to the NIC itself and not even consuming CPU at all. Um, so when I said earlier that Maglev had these decisions, one of the things they do is they do steering of a request comes in, they pick it up off the network card ring, they look at it, they decide which CPU is going to use it, and then they put it into an, you know, a handoff between threads, and then that CPU picks it up and processes it. And they do this to get more bandwidth, and they've, you know, they've got the measurements that show it. But if enough of that processing was happening on the card, you wouldn't bottleneck a single CPU, even at line rate for you know, 80 gigabits of traffic. So at that point, you don't need to do that, and you could end up maybe running one of these things on a single CPU. So you could buy like, the smallest machine you could, single CPU, and just really big network cards. That might be an interesting way of, 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 of putting this together. So I promised to talk about Rust and, and, and user space networking. So uh, what should I write this thing in? Should I clone everything, or should I sort of take it as an inspiration and write my own thing? Is someone doing this? Um, what user space networking bits should I use? Um, I've got some time. I've got a Linux server with no ring exposing cards. I've got an AWS account, but do I want to do this in VMs where I don't even control the hypervisor and I can't debug anything that doesn't work quite right? Uh, it's not like I'm a, a Netflix where I can do that one on Amazon by ringing them up and saying, hey, do you still want my money? And uh, a Windows laptop with Linux in a Hyper-V VM. So, yeah, do I? Rust, I chose Rust because I thought I might want to do the steering between threads. I wanted very, very strict control over exactly what processing was going on where. Because I didn't want to run into things like um, NUMA handoffs, cache coherency between CPUs. I wanted to be able to be explicit. And, and Golang, combination of the garbage collection model and the fact that it abstracts I.O. off into green threads that you don't know anything about made it a no-go for me. It might be a great language, but no, not for this. Um, I do think it would be nice to clone all of Maglev, and it's not super deep. As long as you don't try and implement all the infrastructure it depends on, it should be pretty straightforward. And no one, even a year later, no one is out there implementing Maglev. Someone has implemented the hash algorithm in Go. Uh, I've got, obviously got an implementation in Rust, but that's the size of it so far. So I don't know if people are going yawn or 
if everyone who is actually implementing it is doing it inside you know, a Twitter or a Facebook or, or whatever. Um, and yeah, I, I, I was like, I've got my Surface. I don't want to spend a month doing custom builds of touch drivers to be able to make this run Linux natively. So I'm just going to stay with the VM. So user space networking. Um, who knows the concept of an innovation token? No one. Wow. OK. So an innovation token, these are great things. They are a way of tracking the number of risks you're taking in a project. Like if you have 50 things you need to pull together to make something work and you are innovating on every one of those 50, how well is that going to work? <laughs> Not well at all. But maybe you say, OK, so we know we're going to go to ultra big scale, so our innovation is going to be to use a distributed database. And that's going to be a lot of pain, but everything else is going to be, we're just going to be bog standard. We're going to use Python. We're going to use Linux. We're going to use Package Manager. We're not going to do anything experimental or different there. So thinking about that, user space networking options. There's DPDK, the Intel Data Plane Data Kit. And this thing is a framework in the fullest sense of the word. It wants to own your memory allocation. It wants to own your process startup. It wants to own how you access the network cards. And... Adding, configuring that to talk to Rust just seemed like that was going to be an innovation token I didn't have available to spend. There's SRIOV. Now, this is really cool. You take a, a PCI device and you say, right, I can configure it. That's my physical function. I can change it up in different ways. And then I'll create a virtual function that I can give to some other part of the operating system to use. So I can take my NIC and I can carve off a logical NIC which gets you know, its own unique MAC address, and then I can talk to that on the PCI bus and use it directly, but I, I can't break the machine and the host networking would be unaffected, and that would be lovely. Um, so I want to access a PCI device from user space, from Rust, in a VM. Do I have an SRIOV emulation layer in Hyper-V? Does my Surface have an SRIOV enabled Wi-Fi card? My brain's just started to melt at this point. Um, you know, if I was building a unikernel, this might be a good way to go, but I'm not. So NetMap. NetMap just turned up when I was, I, was, I was poking around, and I found it. I was like, this sounds cool. So 70 megabits, 70 million packets per second on a dual 40 gig NIC, commodity hardware in all other regards, on FreeBSD, so, so the native platform for NetMap. But the way it works, you should be getting almost identical performance on Linux. Um, the folk are working on Windows support. Not that I really care about that, because I'm not planning to deploy this on Windows. But it shows that they're caring about cross-platform. If they care about Windows, probably caring about Linux performance and functionality is going to be good. And it can support situations where you don't have a, a, a NIC that has these hardware rings. So the way the hardware rings work, I've kind of assumed people know about them, is that when a packet comes into a NIC, it has to track a certain amount of data around it. It doesn't just see a long stream of bytes coming off the wire. There's framing even right down at the very Ethernet layer. So it has a, a, a data structure where it records that data and it puts a pointer to it over here. And then the next one that comes in, it, it puts a pointer adjacent to it and so on. But to make sure it doesn't overflow its memory, it's a logical ring. So at a certain point, it will jump back to the beginning and keep writing forward. And so you have a couple of pointers. You have a pointer that says, this is where I'm going to write my next packet metadata, and this is where um, I have had the operating system tell me that that packet has been consumed. And if you don't update these fast enough, the network card just stops listening to the network. Um, and to send, it's the same way, ex exactly reversed, though. You put the packet data somewhere in memory, and you write a pointer to that data to the ring, and you move the pointer that says you should read this packet and send it, forward, and then the network card picks it up and goes off and runs with it. So NetMap exposes that basic machinery directly to user space. You load the module, you open up a, a, a file descriptor, and you select on the file descriptor, and it blocks until the read ring has got something you can read in it. You do what you want to do with it, which could be to copy the packet out. It could be to move the packet to, to go outwards by removing it from the read ring and writing it into the transmit ring, and then you do any syscall, when you go through the syscall barrier, NetMap picks it up, synchronizes those down to the network card, and off it goes. So I was sold by that. Um, this is the basic easiest way, once you've done all the builds and stuff, to send some traffic. And this worked really well for me. 
it blew up my kernel. So it turns out that Hyper-V is a, has a bus, it has a message bus. So you want to send a packet in Hyper-V, what you actually do is write some additional data before the packet. So you need some headroom when you send that down through the kernel stack. Of course, it's actually using a copy on write head function, which as far as I can tell, is meant to give you that headroom even if the packet is shared with other users by doing a copy on write. Unfortunately, that calls down to a function called PSKB expand head, which panics if the buffer is shared. So why is this breaking when the in-tree Linux generator that generates traffic exactly the same way works? Um, it turns out that this is documented as not being required, and the netmap code didn't do it. So, in fact, it does the exact opposite thing. It says, I'm going to do a new packet. Is there any headroom in this, in this buffer? Yes, there is. I'm going to free it up by pushing my pointers to the very beginning of this so that there is no headroom. So not only did it not explicitly honor it, it explicitly rejected it. I reached out to the OpenStack folk I knew who had been working on Hyper-V-based clouds, and I said, hey, there's this little thing. I can just crash any Hyper-V VM if I set up this situation, which entirely reasonable kernel code might do. And they said, oh, you file a bug. So I filed a bug. I tried to describe this reasonably clearly. It could be this. It could be that. I don't know enough to tell the difference. Could you guys please give me some guidance? Two days later, the netmap bug I had filed is closed with a fix. I put a draft together. The guy wanted it done slightly differently. It's all good. It works. Eight months later, the kernel bug is filed. Invalid. Not a bug. You had to use an external driver to provoke this thing. So I got on with my life. Um, at this point, I've got netmap on my VM. It's not crashing the kernel. Everything works. It's fantastic. Um, except that I found another bug. So in this one, you could run this slightly different command. The little hat there says, I want a ring that talks to the host network stack and a ring that talks to the physical network. And so I get four rings. I get two transmit, two receive. And I'll do some stuff with them. And when I close them, the machine will panic. Actually, no, the last bit's not meant to be like that. So that, um, that one there, the, the upstream guy tracked it down for me. He was like, three years. Three years I hadn't seen that happen. <laughs> Uh, there was a bug in the ring flag assessment that led to a use after free, and the kernel's not happy about that. Right, so everything should work, except because you're doing all the network processing yourself, GRO doesn't work, GSO doesn't work, and if you don't turn it off, netmap is fine, your application is fine, you're forwarding packets, but you can't SSH into the machine. And you go, how did I kill that machine? What did I do? You didn't turn this off before you ran your netmap thing. So, so Rust, uh, I, I touched on most of this before, uh, but yeah, it's system language, it's super safe, and you have to choose where you want to be dynamic. I have a little bit of, of the code from Rusty Rail I want to show here, just to sort of give a sense. Like, this is pretty clean code. It's got type annotations, so you, if you're coming from like a Python environment, it's a little strange. Python has grown these, though, and it looks almost identical. Um, this is just taking a hash of a string, then permuting the hash further to get a different hash, and then using both of those to permute um, a bunch of numbers so that you can say which order in a pull, or which place in a pull, that index into a permutation would be. And this is how the core of the Rust's innovative uh, hash algorithm works. Um, and you know, this is the layer above, uh, the, the permutations layer it, it uses, and this is just a loop over how many permutations I want. Oh, I touched something there. Did I? Yes, I did. Well, wow. All right. So, and, and so on. So my point about this is this is all pretty clear code. There are slight differences to what you might be used to, but it's pretty straightforward. You're not really seeing any issues that relate to the borrow checker or to uh, the sort of semi-functional aspects here. It's just straightforward. Um, but, you know, I can also write some terrible code. Do not copy my Rust code. I love Rust. I'm not good at it. Um, this here is showing um, pattern matching and structured error returning. So this, this kind of, is that highlighting there? It's not. So um, where is my mouse? So up here, um, that bit of code there is returning a result that can be cast into the result expected by the higher layers but still carry information. So one of the really lovely things about Rust is it's got these enums that can carry data. It's, it's truly beautiful. 
Um, and now I've lost my mouse pointer entirely. There we go. Okay. So, uh, libpenia. Like I said, I'm really in love with this. Um, it has some quirks. It depends on an abandoned library. Um, and there is kind of a replacement, but that's a, a different and longer story. Um, one of the biggest problems, though, is that the stuff that is on the bleeding edge may not end up being mature and usable. It may end up dying. Um, it does two things. It does this packet manipulation stuff, and it also did a networking stack where it would talk to NetMap or DPDK, not really, um, and, and try and send and receive stuff for you. But that stuff had a problem. Structurally, the way they put their API together, it couldn't do zero copy IO. And they said, hey, OK, that's cool. We'll think about how to do it. So it's a year later. They still can't. Um, this is a TCP uh, header definition or an entire packet definition in, in PNET. And I think this is beautiful. Note, like, it's got U4 and U3 and U9 big endian as types. So you can describe really compactly the exact layout. You can take an RFC, and I did this. I did this for GRE. You can take an RFC, read through the RFC, and it says, here is your frame layout, and you just type that in, and it works. GRE decided to do a linked list inside their header. Don't do that when you're building protocols. So at this point, I can preserve the host network. I can forward packets up and down. I can send them around by MAC address. However, there's a problem using MAC addresses. Nobody actually wants to run up containers with MAC addresses. The solution, obviously, you know, you should use IP addresses. Now, folk who have got their networking hats kind of fully, well, that really, sorry about the uh, presentation layout there. Um, people who are thinking about the networking stuff here heavily are probably going, well, you know, you've been working at a very low level. Clearly, what you need is some resolution for your IP address to a physical address. And the paper didn't discuss this. And like I said, I knew this stuff. I just didn't think about it when I was going, this sounds like a good idea. I'm going to have some fun. And I did have a lot of fun. So I, I started implementing ARP. And then I took a, a second to think. I was like, what about IPv6? IPv6 doesn't use ARP. <laughs> it's got its own thing. Slightly similar, slightly different. Or the kernel knows, so I'll use the kernel's ARP. And that leads me to uh, how do you get that out of the kernel? Do you, do you run subcommands? No, you use Netlink. And Netlink is a network protocol. So pnetlink builds on that libpnet. It's a Netlink library for Rust. And it is as beautiful as anything dealing with Netlink can be, I think. Uh, it's quite straightforward to work with, but I found some really curly bits when I was reading through the kernel and just getting my head around it. Um, if you're going to do this, either get someone else to do it or give yourself some time to get up to speed without any pressure because there are so many functions implemented in Netlink and they've all got slightly different um, idioms in the code. I mean, they all should work exactly the same, but that was just my experience. For example, did you know Netlink is a host endian network protocol? This, I believe, is unique in the world. At least, I have not encountered it anywhere else. Most network protocols, they say, this is a network wire. We're going to be big endian, or we're going to be little endian. But they define it, and they say, any time you want to send something between one process and another over this network protocol, you put it into this format. And then you have N2HS, which is network to host short, uh, to bridge between what you've got in your memory and what the other process is going to do. And even locally, if you've got two processes on the same machine, you go through that translation. Network to host, sorry, host to network going down, and network to host coming back up. So Netlink doesn't do that. Netlink just says, whatever the architecture of your machine does, the in-memory layout is the layout for these packets. So using um, uh, uh, PNet to do this had some friction, because it didn't understand the idea that a network protocol could do this. So we ended up doing um, some, some type definitions. So it, it kind of works, but it's a, it's, it, was, it, was, it was awkward. Um, so this is just a little bit of code that walks over Netlink. So you've got borrow checker stuff happening up the top here. Uh, and like I said, I'm not a great Rust programmer, so there's probably a better way of doing this particular thing. But this is a cache that we want to update. We um, ask 
the cache if the address we're looking for is there and we get back a MAC address to send the packet to. Otherwise, we walk over all the neighbors, cache them all locally in our memory, and then we'll run with that for you know, 30 or 40 seconds, and then we'll do another batch call. Because I didn't want to go out to the kernel on every individual packet I'm sending. I'm not going to get 70 million packets a second doing that. So at this point, I can preserve the host NIC, I can take GRE traffic, I can do a maglev hash lookup on it, I can send that traffic out um, to an arbitrary server identified by IP address. Um, I can't do route, so I still need it in the local thing. I need to do a bit more netlink to look up the IP uh, forwarding table to do the, the route lookup, which will resolve in this, it's exactly the same structure is going to happen. Uh, you can run an arbitrary number of clients and servers. Uh, I haven't defined multiple VIPs, but once I've got the, you know, the entire thing working, having multiple VIPs is just keying off the destination IP address in the GRE in a layer. It'll be very shallow. Um, I've got no stats, no metrics, and no runtime configuration API. So it's, it's there. Uh, I used FreeBSD for testing. I, I kind of started going down the path of Linux, but I found I couldn't get quite the behavior I wanted out of um, base Linux's GRE handling. It really wanted to have a tunnel rather than just be willing to receive GRE on a particular place and unwrap it. Uh, I could have used Open vSwitch to do this, but I wanted this tiny minimal VM. I wanted like a, you know, a 256 meg VM so I could run 10 of them on my laptop and not have it grown under the load. So I was like, okay, well FreeBSD has NetMap and I'm already working in that space having to poke at stuff, so bang. Then I found out that Salt doesn't support FreeBSD for its network configuration, so I had to write a Salt FreeBSD module, which I haven't made complete enough to send upstream. It's still in my tree. Um, I wanted to do some real-world testing. 10 gigabit servers are not actually that easy to get your hands on. VMs, sure, but again, see under, do they really have the rings? Is it going to be high enough fidelity for me? Do I want to spend my time writing a NetMap Zen paravirtualization driver, or do I want to be spending some time playing with Rust and having this kind of fun? So this gets us to the really critical question. Can anyone guess the answer to this? <laughs> no, you shouldn't. I mean, if you want to play with it and you want to have fun, great. Great learning experiment, great learning experience. Uh, and, you know, I send a whole bunch of patches to other projects <coughs> upstream, so I think from an open source perspective, everyone won. Um, my real final bottom line is that we should improve LVS. Like, if I had a, a work reason to do this sort of work, I would put this stuff to the side and say, I love that, here's what we need to do. So we need to do that XDP, eBPF stuff, push packet processing and LVS further down so more of the kernel stack is completely skipped. We need to change from Saru's approach to ECMP and the routers. So that, because I mean the Saru active active thing won't work in AWS either because you can't get it to send traffic to all nodes. Uh, and we should add fragment handling. So at the moment fragments aren't a problem in LVS but if you change the way it works they will become a problem so we need to do that. And we should add five tuple hashing as one of the pluggable things to get a better spread across all of the back end so you get less hotspots. I believe we have about 30 seconds for questions, so get your hands up quickly if you want to do that. Excellent. We always need a starter. Uh, one observation, I think GRE zero, isn't that a magical interface that receives all GRE packets and doesn't require a peer-to-peer -peer bound session? Uh, I don't know. I'll I give that a go in future. Thank you. Um, although I suspect the reverse path, uh, so the, the problem runs into reverse path filtering as well. So you need, like there's a, they tie together. Otherwise you can't send the responses back out. You need, an, you, need, you need the IP address that the VIP is on configured on the box for it to get the traffic. So it's not just unwrapping the traffic at GRE. You have to actually be willing to hand it off to a process. Hi. Um, so at the start of the talk, you said one reason for preferring Rust over Go was uh, so that you could do fancy stuff around threads, like ensuring yes. uh, uh, I don't know, various things. Did you end up having to do that? And was right. it easy to do in Rust? Uh, so I did not. But I could add that in fairly easily. So the thing that Maglev does is it takes the packet in, it calculates the five tuple, it calculates which thread will operate on it, and then it puts it in the queue for that thread, and then it carries on. And then at the far end, on the output side, so it, that, 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 that input process handles the receiving, 
And then at the far end, there's an output process that handles the transmit ring, which receives packets coming in from these worker threads and then puts them into an outbound ring one by one by one and then updates the pointer and sends it off as a batch, you know, like 50 or 1,000 packets, so many milliseconds of, of work. So, or nanoseconds of work. Um, so to do that in Go, like the obvious thing would be to, chat, to use channels, but channels aren't actually going to give you the kind of control that, that I, I think you need here. I, I may be wrong. It would be worth doing the experiment. Um, so the code I've got, we can split out the receive and transmit rings quite easily. So changing to that structure after performance profiling made it obvious that we need it, like if that ever happens. Uh, would be, I think, fairly straightforward. Not trivial, but fairly straightforward. Okay. Now, Rob is actually quite friendly and approachable, so I'm sure if you've got any deep and meaningful questions to ask him, he'd be more than happy to answer them during the rest of the conference. And in the meantime, from the very good people who are running this conference, here's a little something oh. for you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much for your presentation. You're welcome. And in case you're unsure, it's lunchtime.